In this same period, Sir Walter Scott frequently concerned himself with the weird weaving it into his many novels and poems, and sometimes producing such independent bits of narration as the tapestried chamber are wandering Willie's tale in Red Gauntlet, in the latter of which the force of the specter and the diabolic is enhanced by a grotesque homeliness of speech and atmosphere. In 1830, Scott published his letters on demonology and witchcraft, which still forms one of our best compendia of European witch lore. Washington Irving is another famous figure, not unconnected with the weird, for, though most of his ghosts are too whimsical and humorous to form genuinely spectral literature, a distinct inclination in this direction is to be noted by many of his productions. The German students in Tales of a Traveler, of 1824 is a slightly concise and effective presentation of the old legend of the dead bride, whilst woven into the comic tissue of the money diggers in the same volume is more than one hit of piratical apprehensions, uh, apparitions, a apparitions in the realms which Captain Kidd once roamed. Thomas More also joined the ranks of the macabre artist in the poem Alciphron, which he later elaborated into the prose novel of the Epicurean of 1827. Though merely relating the adventures of a young Athenian duped by the artifice of cunning Egyptian priests, more manages to infuse much genuine horror into his account of subterranean frights and wonders beneath the primordial temples of Memphis. De Quincey more than once revels in grotesque and arabesque terrors, though with a desultorious, a, a desultoriness and learned pomp, which deny him the rank of specialist. The era, uh, uh, this era, likewise, saw the rise of William Harrison Ainsworth, whose romantic novels teem with the eerie and the gruesome. Captain Marriott, besides writing such short tales as The Werewolf, made a, a memorable contribution in The Phantom Ship of 1839, founded on the legend of the Flying Dutchman, whose spectral and accursed vessel sails for ever nearer the Cape of Good Hope. Dickens now rises with occasional weird bits like the Signalman, a tale of ghostly warning conforming to a very common pattern and touched with a, veris a verisimilitude which allies it as much as, as much with coming psychological school as with the dying Gothic school. At this time, a wave of interest, a wave of interest in spiritualistic charlatanry, uh, charlatanry, mediumism, Hindu th theosophy, and such matters, much like that of the present day, was flourishing so that the number of weird tales with a psychic or pseudo-scientific basis became very considerable. Were a number of these prolific and popular Lord Edward Bulwer Lighton was responsible, and despite the large doses of turgid rhetoric and empty romanticism in his products, his success in the weaving of a certain kind of bizarre charm cannot be denied. The house in the brain, which hints of Rosicrucianism, and 
at a malign and deathless figure, perhaps suggested by Louis XV's mysterious courtier, Saint Germain, yet survives as one of the best short haunted house tales ever written. The novel Zanoni of 1842 contains similar elements, more elaborately handled, and reduces a vast unknown sphere of being pressing on our own world and guarded by a horrible dweller of the threshold who haunts those who try to enter and fail. Here we have a benign brotherhood kept alive from age to age till finally reduced to a single member. And as a hero, an ancient Chaldean sorcerer, surviving in the pristine bloom of youth to, press, uh, to perish on the guillotine of the French Revolution, though full of the conventional spirit of romance, marred by a ponderous network of symbolic and didactic meanings, and left unconvincing through lack of perfect atmospheric realization of the situations hinging on the spectral world. Zanoni is really an excellent performance as a romance novel and, cannot, and can be read with genuine interest today by the not-too-sophisticated reader. It is amazing to note in describing an attempted initiation into the ancient brotherhood, the author cannot escape using the stock Gothic castle of Walpolian lineage. In a strange story, 1862, Bulwer Lytton shows a marked improvement in the creation of weird images and moods. The novel, despite enormous length, a highly artificial plot, bolstered up by opportune coincidences and an atmosphere of homiletic pseudoscience designed to please the matter-of-fact and purposeful Victorian reader, is excitingly effective as a narrative, invoking instantaneous and unflagging interest, and furnishing many potent, if somewhat, mellow, if somewhat melodramatic, tableaus and climaxes. Again, we have the mysterious user of life's elixir in the person of the soulless magician Margrave, whose dark exploits stand out with dramatic vividness against the modern background of a quiet English town and of the Australian bush. And again, we have shadowy imitations of a vast spectral world of the unknown in the very air about us, this time handled with much greater power and vitality than in Zanoni. One of the two great incantation passages where the hero is driven by a luminous evil spirit to rise at night in his sleep, take a strange Egyptian wand, and evoke nameless presences in the haunted and mausoleum-facing pavilion of a famous Renaissance alchemist, truly stands among the major terror scenes of literature. Just enough is suggested, and just little enough is told. Unknown words are twice dictated to the sleepwalker, and as he repeats them, the ground trembles, and all the dogs of the countryside begin to bay at half-seen amorphous shadows that stalk athwart the moonlight. When a third set of unknown words is prompted, the sleepwalker's spirit suddenly rebels at uttering them, as if the soul could recognize ultimate, abysmal horrors concealed from the mind. And at last, an apparition, an apparition of an absent sweetheart, and a good angel breaks the malign spell. The fragment well illustrates how far Lord Lytton was capable of progressing beyond his usual pomp and stock romance toward that crystalline essence of artistic fear which belongs to the domain of poetry. In describing certain details of incantations, Lytton was greatly indebted to his amusingly serious occult studies, in the course of which he came in t touch with that odd French scholar and capitalist, Alphonse Louis Constant, Eliphas Levi, 
who claimed to possess the secrets of ancient magic and to have evoked the sphere, the specter of the old Grecian wizard Apollonius of Tiana, who lived in Nero's time. The Romance, semi-Gothic, quasi-moral tradition here represented was carried far down the 19th century by such authors as Joseph Sheridan Lefanu, Thomas Prescott Prest, with his famous Varney, uh, Varney the Vampire, uh, 1847, Willie Collins, the late Sir H. Ryder Haggard, who she is really remarkably good, Sir A. Conan Doyle, H.D. Wells, and Robert Louis Stevenson, latter of whom, despite an atrocious tendency toward jaunty mannerisms, created permanent classics in Markheim, The Body Snatcher, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Indeed, we may say that this school still survives, for it clearly belongs to such of our contemporary horror tales that specialize in events rather than atmospheric details, address the intellect rather than the impressionistic imagination, cultivate a luminous glamour rather than a malign ten tensity, our psychological verisimilitude, and take a definite stand in sympathy with mankind and its welfare. It has its undeniable strength, and because of its human element, commands a wider audience than does the sheer artistic nightmare. If not quite so potent as the latter, it is because a diluted product can never achieve the intensity of a concentrated essence. Quite alone, both as a novel and a piece of terror literature, stands the famous Wuthering Heights of 1847 by Emily Bronte, with its mad vista of bleak, windswept Yorkshire moors and the violent, distorted lives they foster. Though primarily a tale of life and of human passions and agony and conflict, its epically cosmic setting affords room for horror of the most spiritual sort. Heathcliff, the modified Byronic villain hero, is a strange dark waif found in the streets as a small child and speaking only a strange gibberish till adopted by the family he ultimately ruins. That he is, in truth, a diabolic spirit rather than a human being is more than once suggested, and the unreal is further approached in the experience of the visitor who encounters a plaintive, a, a plaintive, a plaintive child ghost at a bow-brushed upper window. Between Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw is a tie deeper and more terrible than human love. After her death, he twice disturbs her grave and is haunted by an impalpable presence which can be nothing less than her spirit. Or maybe some specter that doesn't, uh, you know, knows what you did, or maybe it's just his own guilt or... Uh, something. Um, well, I mean, this is fiction, but you know. The spirit enters his life more and more, and at last he becomes confident of some imminent mystical reunion. He says that he feels a strange changing, uh, a strange change approaching, and ceases to take nourishment. At night, he either walks abroad or opens the casement by his bed. When he dies, the casement is still swinging open to the pouring rain, and a queer smile pervades the stiffened face. They bury him in a grave beside the mound he has haunted for eighteen years, and small shepherd boys say that he yet walks with his Catherine in the churchyard, and on the moor 
when it rains. Their faces, too, are sometimes seen on rainy nights behind that upper casement at Wuthering Heights. Miss Brant's eerie ta terror is no mere gothic echo, but a tense expression of man's shuddering reaction to the unknown. In this respect, Wuthering Heights becomes the symbol of a literary transition and marks the growth of a new and sounder school. I have a problem speaking. Okay. Um, special uh, spectral literature on the continent. I've been exhausted for days, so that's why. Um, on the continent, literary horror fared well. The celebrated short tales and novels of Ernst Theodore Wilhelm Hoffman of 17... 76 to 1822 are a byword for mellowness of background and maturity of form. Though they incline to levity and extravagance and lack the exalted moments of stark, breathless terror, which a less sophisticated writer might have achieved, generally they convey the grotesque rather than the terrible. Most artistic of all the continental weird tales is the German classic Undine of 1811 by Friedrich Heinrich Karl, Baron de la Mate Fuppe. In this story of a water spirit who married a mortal and gained a human soul, there is a delicate fineness of craftsmanship which makes it notable in any department of literature and an easy natural uh, and an easy naturalness which places it close to the genuine folk myth. It is, in fact, derived from a tale told by, Renaissance, by the Renaissance physician and alchemist Paracelsus in his treatise on elemental spirits. Undine, daughter, or Undine, is that how you pronounce it? Um, Undine, daughter of a powerful water. I've heard people pronounce it both, but uh, daughter of a powerful water prince was exchanged by her father as a small child for a fisherman's daughter in order that she may, might acquire a soul by wedding a human being. Meeting the noble youth, hold the brand at the cottage of her foster father by the sea at the edge of haunted wood, she soon marries him and accompanies him to his ancestral cast castle of Ringstetten. Holdebrand, however, eventually wearies of his wife's supernatural affiliations and especially of the appearances of her uncle. The malicious woodland waterfall spirit Cahleborn, a weariness increased by his growing affection for Bertalda, who turns out to be the fisherman's child for whom Undine was exchanged. At length, on a voyage down the Danube, he is provoked by some innocent act of his devoted wife to utter the angry words which consign her back to her supernatural element, for uh, from which she can, by the laws of her species, return only once to kill him. Whether she will or no, if he ever, if ever he prove unfaithful to her memory, later, when Holdbrand is about to be married to Bertalda, Undine returns for her sad duty and bears his life away in tears. When he is buried among his fathers in the village churchyard, a veiled, snow-white female figure appears among the mourners. But after the prayer is seen no more, in her place is seen a, li a little silver spring which murmurs its way almost completely around the new grave and empties into a neighboring lake. The villagers shew it to this day and say that Undine and her hold the brand are thus united in death. Many passages and atmospheric touches in this tale reveal Fuka. 
as an accomplished artist in the field of the macabre, especially the descriptions of the haunted wood with its gigantic snow white man and various unnamed terrors which occur early in the narrative. Not so well known as Undyne, but remarkable for its convincing realism and freedom from gothic stock devices is the Amber Witch of Wilhelm Meinhold, another product of the German fantastic genius of the earlier 19th century. This tale, which is laid in the time of the Thirty Years' War, purports to be a clergyman's manuscript found in an old church at Kostro and centers round the writer's daughter, Maria Schweidler, who is wrongfully accused of witchcraft. She has found a deposit of amber which she keeps secret for various reasons, and the unexplained wealth obtained from this lends color to the accusation, an accusation instigated by the malice of the wolf-hunting nobleman Wittick Appelman, who has vainly pursued her with ignoble designs. A lot of the witchcraft accusations were based on people being turned down by women or maybe being seduced by women. Um, but whether they were witches or not, uh, if all they were was having a different religion, you know, there should have been no attacks on them. The deeds of a real witch who afterward comes to a horrible supernatural end in prison are glibly imputed to the hapless Maria, and after a typical witchcraft trial with forced confessions under torture, she is about to be burned at the stake when saved just in time by her level by her lover, a noble youth from a neighboring district. Meinhold's great strength is in his air a casual and realistic verisimilitude which intensifies our suspense and sense of the unseen by half persuading us that the menacing events must somehow be either the truth or very close to the truth. Indeed, so thorough is this realism that a popular magazine once published the main points of the Amber Witch as an actual occurrence of the 17th century. In the present generation, German horror fiction is most notably represented by Hans Heinz Ewers, who brings to bear on his dark conceptions an effective knowledge of modern psychology. Novels like The Sorcerer's Apprentice and now Round short stories like The Spider contain distinctive qualities which raise them to a classic level. But France as well as Germany, has been active in the realm of weirdness. Victor Hugo, in such tales as Hans of Iceland and Balzac in the wild ass's skin, you know, ass means donkey, Seraphita and Louis Lambert, both employ supernaturalism to a greater or lesser extent. Though, generally only as a means to some more human end, and without the sincere and demonic intensity which characterizes the born artist in shadows. It is in the Theophile Gautier that we first seem to find an authentic French sense of the unreal world, and here there appears a spectral mastery which, though not continuously used, is recognizable at once as something alike genuine and profound. Short tales like Avatar, The Foot of the Mummy, and Clarimonde display glimpses of forbidden visits that allure, tantalize, and sometimes horrify, whilst the Egyptian visions evoked in one of Cleopatra's nights are of the keenest and most expressive potency. Gautier captured the inmost soul of the unweighted Egypt with its cryptic life and cyclopean architecture, and uttered once and for all the eternal horror of its netherworld of catacombs, where, to the end of time, millions of stiff, 
spiced corpses will stare up in the blackness with glassy eyes awaiting some awesome and unrealistic, unrelatable summons. Gustave Flaubert aptly continued the tradition of Gautier in orgies of poetic fantasy like the temptation of St. Anthony, but for a strong, realistic bias, might have been an archweaver of the tapestried terrors. Later on, we see the stream divide, producing strange poets and fantasies of the symbolist and decadent schools whose dark interests really center more in abnormalities of human thought and instinct than in the actual supernatural, and subtle storytellers whose thrills are quite directly derived from the night black wells of cosmic unreality, of the former class of artists in sin, the illustrative poet Baudelaire, influenced vastly by Poe, is the supreme type, whilst the psychological novelist Joris, uh, Joris Carl. Giesmann's A True Child of the 1890s is at once the summation and the finale. The latter and the purely narrative class is continued by Prosper Merimi, whose Venus of Ile presents in terse and convincing prose the same ancient statue bride theme which Thomas More cast in ballad form in the ring. The horror tales of the powerful and cynical Gaida Malpassant, written as his final madness gradually overtook him, present individualities of their own being rather the morbid outpourings of a realistic mind in a pathological state than the healthy, imaginative products of a vision naturally disposed toward fantasy and, and sensitive to the normal illusions of the unseen. Nevertheless, they are the keenest interest and poignancy, suggesting with a marvelous force the eminence of nameless terrors and the relentless dodging of an ill-starred individual by hideous and menacing representatives of the outer blackness church they talked about the outer darkness where with gnashing and of teeth and wailing and all that of these stories the horla is generally regarded as the masterpiece relating the advent to france of an invisible being who lives on water and milk sways the minds of others and seems to be the vanguard of a horde of extraterrestrial organisms arrived on earth subjugate and overwhelm mankind. This tense narrative is perhaps without a peer in its particular department, notwithstanding its indebtedness to a tale by the American Fitz James O'Brien. For details in describing the actual presences of the unseen monster, other potently dark creations of De Malpassant are, who knows, the specter, he, the diary of a madman, the white wolf on the river, and the Grizzly Verses Entitled Horror. The Collaborators. Erkman Titrion enriched French literature with many spectral fancies, like the man wolf, in which a transmitted curse works towards its end in a traditional Gothic castle setting. The power of creating a shuddering midnight atmosphere was tremendous despite a tendency toward natural explanations and scientific wonders, and few short tales contain greater horror than the invisible eye, where a malignant old hag weaves nocturnal hypnotic spells which induce the successive occupants of a certain inn chamber to hang themselves on a crossbeam. The owl's ear and the waters of death are full of engulfing darkness and mystery, the latter embodying the familiar overgrown spider theme so frequently employed by weird fictionalists. Villiers de Isle Adam likewise followed the Macabre school, 
his Torture by Hope, the tale of a stake-condemned prisoner permitted to escape in order to feel the pangs of his recapture, being held by some to constitute the most harrowing short story in literature. This type, however, is less a part of the weird tradition than a class particular to itself, the so-called Conte Cruel, in which the wrenching of the emotions is accomplished through dramatic tantalizations, frustrations, and gruesome physical horrors. Almost wholly devoted to this form is the living writer Maurice Lavelle, whose very brief episodes have lent themselves so readily to theatrical adaptions in the thrillers of the Grand Guignol. As a matter of fact, the French genius is more naturally suited to this dark realism than to the suggestion of the unseen, since latter processes require, for its best and most sympathetic development on a large scale, the inherent mysticism of the northern mind. A flourishing, a very flourishing, though till recently quite hidden, branch of weird literature is that of the Jews, kept alive and nourished in obscurity by sombre heritage of early Eastern magic, apocalyptic literature, and capitalism. The Semitic mind, like the Celtic and Teutonic, seems to possess marked mystical inclinations, and the wealth of underground horror lore surviving in ghettos and synagogues must be much more considerable than is generally imagined. Capitalism itself, so prominent during the Middle Ages, is a system of philosophy explaining the universe as emanations of the, the deity and evolving the existence of strange spiritual realms and beings apart from the physical world, of which dark glimpses may be attained through certain secret incantations. Its ritual is bound up with the mystical interpretations of the Old Testament, Tana Curly, they didn't consider it an Old Testament, and attributes an esoteric significance to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, a circumstance which has been imparted to the Hebrew letters a sort of spectral glamour and potency in the popular literature of magic. Jewish folklore has preserved much of the terror and mystery of the past, and when more thoroughly studied is likely to exert considerable influence on weird fiction. The best examples of its literary use so far are the German novel The Golem by Gustav Meyerink and the drama The Dybbuk by the Jewish writer using the pseudonym Enski. The former, with its haunting shadow, suggestive marvels and horrors just beyond reach, is laid in Prague and describes a singular mastery that the city's ancient ghetto with its spectral peak gables. The name is derived from the fabulous artificial giant supposed to be animated by medieval rabbis according to certain cryptic formula. The Dybbuk translated and produced in America in 1925 and more recently produced as an opera describes with singular power the possession of a living body by the soul of a dead man. Both golems and Dybbuks are fixed types and serve frequent, as frequent ingredients of later Jewish tradition. And...